Good afternoon. My name is Michael Ayers. I'm a mobile application architect at Sapient Nitro. And today, I want us all to start thinking like scientists. In software development, it's easy to plan for things that go right. We call this the happy path. This tends to happen naturally since we begin developing a new feature. We're given a spec and a set of known conditions, and we implement that desired functionality. I'm skipping slides. Apologies here. <clears throat> but what happens when things go wrong? I'm sure we've all been there where we hand over a build of a new app to a new user and they manage to crash it in less than 10 seconds. They're able to do this since they're coming in with an open mind and no expectation of how the app should function. It can be overwhelming at times to track down a bug. Let's take a systematic approach to solving the problem. What's the best kind of mistake? One that we can learn from. And what's an even better kind of mistake? One that someone else makes. Today, I'll share some of my past experiences in hopes that you never make the same mistakes that I did. But first, let's take a refresher course on the scientific method. The scientific method is a process for experimentation that is used to explore observations and answer questions. By following a consistent set of steps, we have a system to yield repeatable results. Let's break down each step. First, we start with a question. Think of the five W's. Who, what, when, where, why, and the tricky one, how. Typically, our questions come in the form of a bug report. Why isn't this working? Next, we want to take advantage of existing information. It's likely that someone else has already experienced an issue similar to yours. After that, we construct a hypothesis. This is our educated guess about why a certain behavior is occurring and what will happen if we make changes. A hypothesis follows a pattern similar to that of a user's story. If I do this, then this will happen. An experiment tests whether or not your prediction is accurate, and if, not, and if your hypothesis is supported or not. We also want to know what caused the results, so it's important to change only one thing at a given time during an experiment. Afterwards, you should collect data during your experiment, and analyzing this data will tell us if our hypothesis was correct or not. If the data supports our hypothesis, hooray, the, then our test is complete. If it doesn't, then the cycle begins again. We can either refine our hypothesis or change a different variable and run our experiment again. After a successful experiment, we'll want to report our results. That's great and all, but how do we apply this to debugging? Because that's why we're all here. Let's distill it down to its simplest form. Have an idea, measure and test, repeat as needed. I do quite a bit of work in the retail space, so my examples often tend to be commerce related. Let's suppose that we're working on a catalog app and QA has reported a new defect. Items can no longer be added to the cart. Well, it's simple, right? First, we tap the Add to Cart button, and then we see the items in the cart. But there's a lot more going on here. Where along the way can things go wrong? Well, pretty much anywhere. So what sort of questions should we ask ourselves in order to track down the issue? Don't ignore the obvious. Start with the simple things. Are we connected to the outside world? And then move on to the more complicated ones. Are we formatting our requests properly? Is the response from the server coming back in the format that we expect? At first, some problems appear to be too daunting to take on. So start at one end of the problem and work your way to the other. 
So how do we go about confirming our hypothesis? In an experiment, remember that we only want to change one thing at a time. Sometimes I'll see developers make a handful of code changes and then wonder what happened. Well, if you change multiple things, how do you know what really solved the problem? So let's break out of our post-lunch food coma and stretch our brains a bit. Suppose that we write software for an automotive company. Let's start with an easy feature. What sort of tests should we run to determine whether or not we can operate the windshield washers? Do we have fluid? All right, then we're good to go. Now, let's add a new feature, a sunroof. Of course, we don't want the occupants of our car to get wet, so what sort of changes do we need to make to our tests? Not only do we need to check the fluid level, we also need to ensure that the sunroof is closed. Of course, we don't want to test only for success, but for failure too. With these conditions, there's only one combination that should allow us to clean the windshield, but we should account for the outliers as well. You know, if the sunroof is closed, but we don't have fluid, if we're empty and the sunroof is open, and so on. Now let's move beyond simple booleans. The next feature that we're tasked to develop is a lane change assist. The premise is easy. If the, car, if the distance to the car in the left lane is too close, it'll trigger an alert. But it's not quite that simple. We need to monitor the change in distance. If the other car is closing in, or is it maintaining its position, we might have enough room and enough time to change lanes. And of course, this is also dependent upon speed. We'll need a larger buffer or distance the faster we're going. Now, let's look at some examples, otherwise known as learning from my mistakes. For our first example, I'd like to talk about a physical installation that we did for an eyewear retailer. Now, you see, there's an inherent problem when searching for prescription lenses. The in-store samples have plain lenses, and since your vision is blurry without your corrective lenses, you can't clearly see what you look like while you're wearing the frames. So our solution, a digital mirror. This fixture consists of a display behind mirrored glass and with cameras to capture the front and side images of the customer. And since people tend to vary in height, we added two additional rows of cameras so that we can take our photos as close as possible to eye level. Development was well underway when we ran into a bit of a bump. In addition to prescription eyewear, this retailer also sells sunglasses. Sunglasses with polarized lenses, to be specific. Now, I'm sure some of you can see where this is going. If you remember, our fixture had the display in portrait orientation. Now, you see, funky things happen when you get two polarizers out of phase with each other. They effectively cancel each other out, and you can't see anything on the display. Fortunately, we discovered this early during our development process prior to rollout, and we were able to source LCD displays with a circular polarizer similar to those that are on our phones. The key takeaway here is to test with production hardware and accessories as soon as possible. Development on this project continued, and it was time for our early in-store tests. Since shopping can be a social experience, we had to account for multiple people within the field of view of the camera. The easiest solution was to look for the largest face within the frame. Of course, nothing is ever easy, and you should always expect the unexpected. I feel that this tweet is a great example to account for things that are both expected and unexpected. Here, a QA engineer walks into a bar, orders a beer, as expected, well, orders zero beers, orders a lot of beers, orders a lizard, well, that's kind of strange, orders a negative quantity, and then just orders some gibberish. So, again, this was going back to the happy path example. You know, as we're developing a feature, we tend to think about how should things work? You know, sit down at our desks, put on our headphones, we develop, develop our feature, 
And we don't oftentimes consider, well, what happens when we get like fuzzy input or bad or unexpected data? Uh, and oftentimes, this is why you hand your phone over to someone else and immediately your app crashes because they did something that you just flat out didn't expect. All right, back to our store. Anyone who's set foot in a retail location knows that there's marketing and branding everywhere. So looking for the largest face doesn't necessarily give us the closest face, which is the one that we really care about. We're able to refine our face detection logic and get the desired result. So not only do you need to test with production hardware, you should also replicate the final conditions as accurately as possible. Or as I like to say, get real, real fast. Now that we've seen what can happen out in the wild, what are some steps that we can take to prevent some of these mistakes from happening in the first place? XC test to the rescue. XC test is a framework used by Xcode for testing. It was added in Xcode 5 and has since become very well integrated into the IDE. Um, if you've done any sort of unit testing in the past, say like Xcode 3, Xcode 4 days, it was pretty tedious to set things up. You had some third party dependencies, lots of project configuration, but now it's nicely integrated right into our dev workflow. To begin testing, we'll want to create a subclass of XC test case. Before each test in an XC test case is run, the setup method is called, and when that test finishes, the teardown method is called. This gives us an opportunity to set up necessary state before testing and an opportunity to clean up afterwards. This would include things like setting up a core data stack, uh, maybe configuring some mock data, uh, whatever state we might need before each individual test executes. And within each test case, every method that begins with the word test is executed and determines a pass or a fail. Now what determines if a test passes? Assertions. When distilled down, the simplest test you can write is an assert. The test passes when the expression evaluates to true, and if it fails, the format string is printed out to the console. There are other types of assertions available. They can test Boolean logic, equality, and perform nil checks, just to name a few. Testing at its simplest terms, we can set inputs, and test for the desired or expected outputs. Remember our windshield washer example from earlier? Well, let's write a test case for that. First, we'll need a set of inputs for our desired scenario. Here, yep, we have fluid and of course our sunroof is closed. And we wanna test for the expected output. Here, I'm asserting true that yes, in fact, with these conditions, I can operate the windshield washer. Of course, our test wouldn't be complete if we didn't test for failure too. Now, these assert assertions are great for testing properties and methods that return values immediately, but what about routines that take some amount of time to execute? How do we test those? Expectations. Apple added XC test expectations in Xcode 6. This allows us to test asynchronous methods and to ensure that a delegate method or completion block gets called as expected. So let's look at an example. Here's a test that checks various properties as a result of a network operation. First, we create an expectation and create a reference to it. Next, we set our desired inputs. Then we tell Xcode that this will need a bit of time to complete. So down here towards the bottom, we call this method, wait for expectations with timeout, and we can pass in the approximate amount of time that we expect this test could take. And then we test for our desired outputs. Here are our assertions, uh, checking some equality, making sure that my response data wasn't nil, uh, and that I didn't get an error. Here, again, kind of happy path, making sure that everything works out all right. Finally, we call fulfill on our expectation to tell Xcode that this particular asynchronous test is complete. If we have a large test suite, it can take a long time to complete. And sometimes we don't want to run our entire test suite. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just run a single test? 
Well, now we can. See the diamond icon in the gutter next to the line numbers? Clicking on this will run that given test. And our test passed. Hooray! While this is no replacement for Swift Playgrounds and the REPL, I do find that this can be helpful when developing new functionality within an app. If I need to execute a test and a certain chunk of code, I no longer need to tap and swipe and navigate throughout my app. I can just click a button and see my results. Here's another real world example. This particular app had a section with a long scrolling list of social content within a table view. QA was reporting choppy scrolling and overall perfor poor performance within this one area, and it was our job to figure out why. First, we need to observe the behavior of the app. Anytime I see sluggish UI, my first step is to see, are we doing excess work on the main thread that could be locking up our UI? Uh, and the time profiler instrument is perfect for gathering this type of data. So let's fire it up. We'll use this run as our baseline, and all future runs will be compared to this. Well, we certainly are spending a lot of time on the main thread. Let's dig in a little deeper and see where all these CPU cycles are going. Drilling in, we find that a lot of our time is spent in this utility class and a method that's doing date conversions. Let's jump to the code and see what's going on. Here's an abbreviated version of the method for example. Hmm, well, at first glance, nothing really seems to be out of the ordinary. But remember, this method gets called often, and I seem to recall someone saying something about creating date formatters being expensive. I have a hunch or a hypothesis that if we only create one instance of our date formatter and reuse it, then our overall performance will improve. But before we go making changes, we need a control. For this test, we can use another feature of XC test case, the measure block method. When this particular test runs, the code inside of the block will be executed a total of 10 times, and the duration of each iteration, along with some statistics, will be printed out to the console. Here, I formatted the data and converted the time to milliseconds. Note that this test was run on my laptop, so the execution times are fairly low. Now back to the code. Remember, our hypothesis was to create only one date formatter and reuse it. So let's make those changes. Here, we attempt to retrieve a date formatter from our cache based on the desired format string. And if we have it, we'll go ahead and proceed with our date conversion. If not, we'll create one and then store it for use later. Now let's run our test again and see if it made a difference. Well, I'd say that's a pretty significant difference. This data pretty much confirms our hypothesis that the first execution is about the same, but since we're reusing our date formatters, all of our future ex executions are much, much faster. While this isolated test gave us pretty good results, let's see what impact it made back in context of our application. By running another instrument session, we can confirm that we're spending far less time in this method overall. With these CPU cycles freed up, the, uh, freed up on the main thread, our table scrolls buttery smooth, and we can pass the app back over to QA for retest. So you see here, we're spending approximately about a tenth of the time uh, overall in this one method uh, before and after when you compare them. So let's revisit our simplified uh, approach to the scientific method. What steps did we follow along the way? Well, we formed a hypothesis about the use of our date formatters. We performed experiments with measure blocks and instruments. We analyzed the results. And we published our finding, proving that we are one of those elusive 10x developers. As we wrap up here today, I'd like to leave you with a few final thoughts. Some tests are better than no tests. We could talk all day about TDD and code coverage, and the answer to the question, you know, what percentage of code coverage should I shoot for is, well, it depends. You know, it depends on the needs of your specific organization and the project at hand. Whenever I'm assigned to fix an issue in an unfamiliar code base, 
I often find it helpful to write a test or two to ensure that the problem is really solved, and also maybe that I haven't introduced any regressions or unintended side effects. Remember that some tests are better than no tests. Recently, I came across this bit of info about the train system in Switzerland. To avoid falsely signaling a section of track is clear by resetting the axle counter to zero and thus avoiding collisions, the total number of axles in a train must not equal 256. Well, that's frightening. <laughs> While this scenario doesn't exactly apply to testing or mobile apps, it did get me thinking. With mobile devices growing in popularity in all industries, it is now our responsibility as developers to deliver quality and bug-free software. Now, I don't know about you, but I would prefer that any software that I write doesn't have bugs that cost people their money, or even worse, their lives. So in closing, if you only take away one thing today, please remember to always expect the unexpected, test in real conditions, and be sure to test for failure. Thank you. Sure. Like UI testing in Xcode, and do you or do you think there are you have some built-in tools in Xcode 8 or Xcode 7? But do you think there are some other framework also that can be used, or are they are they even in the Xcode tools are they even to the point that they can be used for creating or testing real applications? Right. Uh, again, going back to the the unit test code coverage example, like you know, how much of our app should we cover? Uh, and it's funny that you bring this up. So, automated UI testing is a pretty hot topic uh, around my office here lately. Clients are asking for it, uh, and we're uh, we've been evaluating various tools. Um, in some cases, implementing our own. Uh, so, the framework that you're referring to. So, you have your XC UI test, uh, where you can record uh, your scripts, which is nice that way we're not handwriting these test scripts, um, and you can see the, uh, the steps being written along the way. So if you do need to make a change, it effectively becomes source code that you can edit, and since it's source code, it's nice that they can be versioned as well. So that's part of Xcode, and if we're all only iOS developers and we're in a shop that only works on the Apple platform, you know, Xcode UI testing, that's pretty good for us. Uh, if you're at a shop that does development for various platforms, um, Android, Android, Windows, and so on, uh, you know, then you need to support multiple things. And if you st start using multiple tools, then that becomes a bit of, a, of an issue. Um, so currently, we are exploring both ctest and monkey talk. Um, similar type of behavior, uh, scripts that hook into your accessibility labels, so you can target various controls, text fields, set text, simulate actions, type, uh, taps, swipes, and so on, and run your scripts. Now, this is kind of a in theory versus an in practice thing. So in theory, it sounds great. You know, I want full coverage of my app or pretty solid coverage. Uh, but in practice, you do run into challenges like you can't target system level alerts. So, uh, you know, kind of going back to the, the testing methodology and control and changing one variable at a time, our process, we like to start fresh. Clean device, you know, clean install every time. Not install of the OS, but install of our app. So uh, our scripts in CI will take the new build, install it on a device, execute our test, configure, or our test suite, and then when we're done, we record our results in Jenkins, and then we remove the app from the device, so it's effectively a nice, clean, pristine uh, state for some other app or some other test to start from. Now, since we are installing our app fresh every time, any permissions that might be part of our startup sequence or process flow, like um, location awareness or push notification, like you can't access them, you can't target them, you can't accept or dismiss them. So depending upon the UX of your app, if you're asking for those permissions up front, that's a completely separate topic. You should never do that immediately up front at launch. We see it all the time. 
Uh, but I'm effectively blocked right then and there, and I cannot proceed. I can't execute any more test cases. Uh, my current personal thought is cover the the basic use cases. Um, again, the uh, you know, the comment that I made about the happy path. So a commerce app. Can I log in? Can I browse a category? Can I browse a product? Can I add that product to cart? Maybe check out, although checkout can get to be a bit hairy at times. And if that's our baseline foundation, and we're running these tests as part of our continuous integration process, and a developer breaks something along the way and one of those tests fails, it's nice that we're alerted to it, that hey, a test that was passing has now failed, let's go look into it and figure it out. And if you're testing across multiple devices or configurations, uh, fortunately, our ecosystem isn't quite as fragmented as say the Android ecosystem, but now, you know, even if you're supporting iOS 9 and newer, you're still back to that whole pesky 4S thing. So you got the really short, you know, squatty square phones, the 5s and 5Ss, 6, 6 pluses, and fortunately the 7s and 7 pluses, they're effectively 6, so that's kind of a wash there. But I don't want a QA engineer to go through and test all of these scenarios. You know, let a computer do that. Computers are really good at repeating tasks. Uh, you know, let it run overnight. And that way, we can have our you know, QA people, they can focus on the hard problems. And if they have um, a funky edge case or defect, you know, then they can come over and talk to us about it. So, you know, short summary there. I think the UI testing is interesting. Um, I haven't found it to be terribly practical in a production type of scenario, which is unfortunate because I'm really excited about it. It's a really powerful tool, but you know, based on the UX of your app, um, if you're doing any like custom rendering, like non UI kit related things, then things tend to break. So, you know, like I said, in theory, it's great. In practice, I find that it kind of tends to fall apart pretty quickly. We cannot test uh, folder. Anything that has permission, we cannot. Right. Anything. Yeah, any permissions. Uh, there was a. There's a way around that. Oh, perfect. And care to share? I don't know the details. Of Magic. That. So, okay. Um, again, let's do some research because someone else has already solved this problem for us. Uh, but yeah, again, the, um, the commerce example, like barcode scanners, pretty common features, right? So not only would I need to fire up the camera UI, but now there's some sort of expected reaction to my environment is a barcode in the frame. And, well, I mean, I guess I could. I could set up my you know, device maybe on a tripod or like a gorilla pod or something like that and have a barcode in the frame, but that's pretty ridiculous. Uh, actually, that reminds me, I saw a great tweet. Uh, I think it was the, is it the, the London subway that has the Oyster card? Uh, but either way, their metro system. So they were testing these RFID scanners over and over to do stress testing. So they had a model train set and a circular track. <laughs> the reader on one side and all of these train cars had these RFID cards taped to the side. So they could just let this thing run all night in circles and it would read and read and read. Um, I thought that was brilliant. Uh, I've also seen something similar like, you know, the automated, you know, tender swipe right. It's like a constant device that's just, you know, using a capacitive touch stylus and constantly swiping on the, uh, on the device. So, I mean, people will find creative ways around anything here. Awesome. Yeah, I know this was a crash course in unit testing. Um, there's so much more to it um, around uh, mock data and things like that. But I think the, uh, the key takeaway here, again, is you know, take a step back. You know, we, we develop our software, and we, since we know how it's supposed to work, oftentimes we have tunnel vision and we implement that feature, that exact workflow, this particular type of data or input. But, you know, Take a step back, take a break, you know, go outside for a walk, uh, you know, try a variety of things. Um, this is venturing into the, the UI UX world, but you know, can you see your UI out in bright sunlight? Um, I remember getting a comment from a developer or a designer around that. It's like, hey, you know, this UI doesn't have enough contrast. Um, and again, going back to the accessibility topic from earlier, uh, contrast is a key thing for people with uh, some visual impairments, but even if you don't, hey, you know, I tend to like to be able to read the UI and the content. Uh, and when I went to, uh, to have a conversation with this designer, 
the response that I got was, well, it looks great on my monitor. I'm like, yeah, of course it looks great on your nice, you know, cinema display, full brightness, controlled lighting. What happens when, you know, I venture out in the sunlight or I'm on a subway and connectivity goes in and out. So, uh, you know, definitely uh, take a break from your desk, you know, get up, walk around, uh, often helps clear your head. You'll uh, find answers to your problems when you least expect it. Awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah, so if you're interested, yes, Turbo Tomato. Uh, it's mostly software related. I tend to geek out about coffee too, so if you're into coffee and food and software, then uh, follow me. You might find it to be interesting. If not, then don't follow me because you'll be bored. <laughs> uh, side note, Twitter is a fantastic resource for, for developers. I'm sure we all know that, but you know, the developer community is a tight, close-knit group. You know, John and the 360 conferences, I think, are a perfect example of that. But you know, I, I find it amazing that people that we tend to think of as our competitors out there in the marketplace, you know, they're our competition. They're trying to win work away from us, you know, from our clients. You know, if somebody has a bug or an issue and they find an answer to it, like they'll post about it. Or if they post a bug, you might find another shop replying to it. Like, hey, yeah, I had this issue. Like, here's an answer. Uh, or a solution that worked for me. So I do find, uh, find Twitter and the Mac and Apple community to be uh, a pretty good match. Just check your code, how would do that? We switch the testing app to the Springboard app, and then you can find the alert. Awesome, so this use case of you're trying to pick media from the camera app, or no, consume, well, capture media well, like via the camera? We ask for location. From that oh, right. So we do the same thing. We we clean the clean the, the simulator and install the app before every test. And so when we come up, then we ask for location immediately, and we have to dismiss that to be able to continue to move through the app. So in our in our UI framework, we switch the testing app to the Springboard app, find the alert, dismiss it. Oh, perfect. I guess that makes sense. So for those of you in the back of the room, uh, we're talking about being able to target OS level um, confirmations and dialogues, uh, like push notifications or location and so on. Um, so the suggested implementation or solution here is since our test scripts have an API and we can programmatically write our own test scripts here, uh, the potential solution here is instead of having a reference to one application, my app, I can create a reference to Springboard have that be the current app that's in focus. Our app goes to the background. Springboard um, comes into the foreground. And I guess from Springboard, then you have the, uh, the scope to, uh, to target the OK cancel buttons in these dialogues. I'm assuming tap OK, switch back to your own app, and go about it. That's fantastic. I'll have to give that a shot. Thank you. See? Again, community sharing. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Deal.